state even acutely. So this is something you can take right now before your, your workout. Um, you're going to delay what we call delay the progression of fatigue. And how would, how would people start to approach this practice? I, my understanding is you can do this with common, um, you know, store-bought baking soda. No question. Um, there's always a concern about gastric distress, oh, um, that it's a very effective laxative, um, sometimes an, an unwanted laxative effect. But how would one approach this before? Let's say I'm, I'm going to, I'm doing the mile repeats yep. exercise, uh, uh, mile repeats uh, protocol that we talked about earlier. I'm doing that for a few months and now I want to try the sodium bicarb yep. approach. I'm well hydrated. Hopefully I'm well rested. I'm ready to go. When am I going to drink this um, sodium bicarb solution? What? How would I make the solution? Uh, let's say I'm, I take 10 ounces of water. Yeah. How much bicarb do I want to, sodium bicarb should I put in there? Can we come up with it? Is it half a teaspoon? Is it a teaspoon? Um, here's what I'm going to tell you. You will thank me by starting lower. You can always go more later. So a little pinch. You cannot go backwards. How about I start with a quarter teaspoon? Fine. Half, honestly, half is fine. Half a teaspoon. It's totally fine. Dissolve that. Yep. Slug that down. Yep. I, I read a study recently that showed that people will hit their, um, the, the peak benefits of this at different times, but it's somewhere, if, I, if memory serves me correctly, somewhere between 60 and 90 minutes later. So I might want to drink it on the way to the track. It, it can. It can be as low as 20. Okay. So maybe um, as I get to the track, since I'm going to do some warm up with some walk and jogging. I, I say 45 minutes. Okay. That's a, just a very rough standard. But yeah, you're right. It is it is individualized. Um, and you probably want to play with that a little bit. If not, just somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to an hour. Okay. And then um, the perceived and real fatigue if done correctly, the perceived and real fatigue ought to be reduced. Yes. I can do more work without feeling exhausted. Will I feel less of a lactate burn? Yep. It, done in air quotes for those listening. I realize that's a very crude way to describe a complex yep. physiological process. Yep. Um, fantastic. Can sodium bicarb be used repeatedly for longer duration training? Yep. And if I were going to use it with um, weight training for whatever reason. Maybe I'm doing circuit type training yeah. or I'm doing the superset type strength training that you talked about before, push-pull, push-pull, where it's a little bit more cardiovascularly demanding. Yep. Um, then maybe I'd sip that throughout the workout, make sure there's a bathroom nearby, it <laughs> sounds like. Because I do, I am aware that um, many people get pretty serious gastric distress. It can happen very quickly. Okay. Great. Well, it sounds like an amazing training tool. Um, I really appreciate you sharing because I think it's, it's one that doesn't get a lot of airtime these days because it's been around, but... Um, sounds like it has some pretty impressive effects. Yeah, you, you know what's sort of funny about that is, I mean, I get it, pop culture is what it is, but still to this day, if you want to talk about sort of your most effective general health slash performance supplementation, it's the same three to four to five. And it, they're written there, it's because they work really well. Without going into the chemistry of each one and the practice of each one, because I definitely want to get you back to talk about diet, nutrition and supplementation oh, yeah. um, at some point. But I think we need a full couple of hours to get that right, yep. at least. Um, if you, as a teaser, would you mind just listing off the other um, supplements that you have found are very effective for for many people. So sodium bicarb or baking soda is one. What are some of the other ones? Yep, we'll go kind of in reverse order. Beta alanine is another very classically effective one. Um, similar idea with sodium bicarbonate. So it's, it's, it's going to, beta alanine is going to come in, it's going to be converted and stored as what's called carnosine in the muscle. And carnosine is an intracellular buffer. So in other words, it's just going to delay the buildup of acid. Um, so, so fatigue blocker, if you will. So very effective, very cheap, very safe, um, well studied. The top one, though, of all of them by far that has an incredibly strong profile, it has, it is a cheap, it is a simple form to get, has a important magnitude of effect, and is uh, effective across multiple domains of physical health and performance. And it is, because of that, it is my crown jewel. It is, in my opinion, without question, the Michael Jordan of all supplementation. And that's creatine monohydrate. It affects so many things. We typically think about it as its muscle stuff, right? You've, you've talked kind of you quickly, we're talking about the creatine phosphate system, but we have to realize on depression and to be very clear, I am certainly not saying you can take creatine and cure anything. And I'm not saying it's going to stop you from depression or anything, but I'm saying there's, there's a lot of research in these areas and there's a reason people are doing it. Yeah, I completely agree. And if you're willing, I'd love to have you back for us to do a discussion on creatine and the brain or creatine in the nervous system. Yeah. That would be a lot of fun. And maybe we can do a, a kind of a journal club in advance of that. Uh, for yeah. those that don't know, a journal club is where 
um, scientists uh, read a bunch of papers and then argue about them, discuss them, and try and extract the, the kind of um, uh, agreed upon center of mass, uh, if you will. I, I think uh, I've long been taking five grams of creatine monohydrate per day for mainly for the cognitive effects. Yeah. It, um, I sense an effect. Uh, that's obviously anecdata, data, but there, I think there are a lot of data out there as, as you there, There's enough. To. That you're, not, you're not crazy. There's enough there. Uh, and in fact, there's enough mechanism now um, to understand the metabolic needs. Mm -hmm. People think the meta, um, I'm a muscle guy, right? So I'm going to think about the metabolism needed to fuel muscle. But we forget cells, mm -hmm. immune cells, red blood cells, nerve cells, astrocytes, brain, all this stuff requires energy. And it's all going through metabolism. Super interesting. We, we will do the deep dive on that soon. I have a final question for you. You're involved in a really interesting, I think really cutting edge project that I first learned about from you. I don't know of anyone else doing anything um, as forward thinking and frankly as relevant to the general population because of uh, my interest in people getting better sleep and learning oh. how to do that, avoiding stress and learning how to do that. Tell us a little bit about what I believe is called absolute rest. Right, so this is something that we've been playing with behind the scenes. Um, for a long time. And this is typically how high performance stuff works, right? People want exclusivity. And and so this has been built. Um, effectively, what happened is a friend of mine, Cody Burkhart, I don't know if you know Cody, but a famous. Uh, down in Texas. Yeah. Yeah. NASA. NASA guy. Yeah, I do know Cody. Wonderful, just down the road thinker. Um, everyone's interested in sleep, right? And for forever, I would say, God, we're using it with athletes, but everything available tells you how you're sleeping. Nothing can tell you why you're sleeping that way. And so we, we got together uh, in Boulder, and then I met some of his former colleagues, computer science folks, um, Harvard MD, um, and, and some really impressive tech folks. And we were just thinking about an idea, and we came up with, we started to realize the problems, right? We use first principle thinking. It's one of my favorite approaches. Um, if you're not familiar with that, go go Google that. Like, that's just a recipe to solve problems, this first principle thinking. And we just started to think about like, man, all the sleep tech is, is there. It's real. I don't need to convince people that they need sleep. Everyone's done that. You need high quality sleep, but how can I provide solutions? And with the people I work with, I can't just tell them your testosterone's down or your sleep's down or recover. I need to be able to be like, this is down and here's why and here's our solution. That That's how our high performance world works. So enter absolute rest. This is saying, okay, what are the actual nodes that go into high effective, you can't go back to sleep, here are a bunch of things, right? So we have some screens that we can do and there's some other stuff we can do to analyze this. This is a psychological issue. Let's say it's not. Right? You're under control and we have different tricks we use and, and stuff on which I'm happy to talk about, but it's not that. Okay, is it physiology, which is node number two? Do we know what your dopamine levels are like? Do we know what your serotonin levels are like? What's melatonin look like? What's this, what's adrenaline? What's cortisol? Cortisol being the primary driver um, what, what is this relationship, DHEA? Where are these things at? So we're going to measure all that and, and track that. We're going to measure that during the day, prior to sleep. We're going to measure that next morning and even sometimes throughout sleep. And we're going to figure out, is this a physiology problem? If it is, then